You're listening to the 2018 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Program. This session features Gavin Bishop in conversation with Tanya Norfolk. Māori ora ki a tātou te whānau e hui hui mai nei tēnā tātou katoa. Tēnei te mihi atu ki a Page and Blackmore. Ko Tanya a hau. Uh, nā ku te onore ki te mihi atu ki a Gavin Bishop. So it's my great pleasure and honour to introduce Gavin to you. Um, please join me, first of all, in giving him a, a warm welcome. So just before we really get underway, I just want to read a bit of an intro to Gavin. Um, we, we could talk at length about all the things Gavin's achieved in his career. So this is just in a nutshell. So Gavin Nati Pukeko, Nati Awa, Nati Mahuta Tainui is an internationally and nationally acclaimed New Zealand children's author and illustrator who lives in Christchurch. He's published over 70 books and been translated into 12 languages. His first book, which some of you might still have in your collection, published in 1981 was Mrs. McGinty and the Bizarre Plant. Um, Gavin has won numerous awards, including this year's Margaret Mahi Book of the Year Award for his book, Aotearoa, which is fantastic, and we'll talk more about, about that. Aotearoa, the New Zealand story. Um, he's also written for television and theatre, and even to libretti for the Royal New Zealand Ballet. His latest book is Cook's Cook, the cook who cooked for Captain Cook, and it tells the story of Captain James Cook's journey to the South Pacific, but through the eyes of the ship's cook, John Thompson. Um, so Gavin, welcome back to Nelson. Some of you may have been here, Gavin was here, we think three years ago, um, to talk about Piano Rock, which if you haven't read that, I can highly recommend it. It's a fantastic little book. Um, my sons and I thoroughly enjoyed reading that. Um, now, Gavin, I just have to ask, before we get underway too, we've just had the Royal New Zealand Ballet in Nelson, which is a rare treat. Did anyone make it to the ballet? Not in this room. But I'm just curious what it's like to write for a ballet. It was quite a challenge. And when I first, when I came up with some of the ideas I, I initially had for the set, they said, no, 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 we can't have anything like that. You have to push all that away back to the back of the stage or get rid of it. Because we, we, we need to dance on that, on that bit of the stage, which I thought was a jolly nuisance. <laughs> However, um, the biggest challenge, as I said, was writing a story that didn't require any dialogue. Nobody could say anything. So it all had to be sort of self-explanatory, um, just through action and through gesture and through mime. And I was lucky that I was working with two other really good people who had done a lot of work for the New Zealand Ballet previously. One, was called Russell, one guy was called Russell Kerr. And those of you who are old enough would remember him from the Southern Ballet days. He was a fantastic choreographer, and in his young years, he was an actual, he was a dancer as well. Um, and um, Philip Norman was the composer. So the three of us worked together. I had to come up with a story, and it was a story that would be told, I said, without words, but also would last no longer than an hour. So they didn't want, you know, a great big epic. They wanted something that was quite short, something suitable to take to, to around, the, around New Zealand for school children to see. Thank you. So I could go on for a long time about you it because it was actually a very interesting, yeah, very, very interesting experience. experience. So, of course, we're here to talk about your latest book, Cook's Cook, and we will come to that um, in a bit. But Kevin's just going to start us off with a question I find kids and, and adults often want to know is, where do you get your ideas from? Yeah. And um, Kevin's going to talk a little bit about some, some of his own uh, personal hin history that's ended up in some of his books. Thank you. I've sort of tentatively called this talk um, a sense of place because I've had this kind of passion, I suppose, 
uh, throughout all of the years that I've been writing books for children, I've really wanted to tell our stories to our children. Now, when I first started writing for children in the late 1970s, very, 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 very few books were published in New Zealand that told stories that were set here. Very, very, very few. Most of the books that we had in New Zealand for children up to about the 1970s had come from England or America, sometimes Australia. Um, I can remember reading a book once when I was at, at primary school called Bush Christmas, which was set in Australia. And it was really, really strange to read this book set in this part of the world about some children who got lost in the bush at Christmas time in Australia. And so, um, and then when I became interested in writing, for books, uh, writing books for children, I came across a book called The Bunyip of Berkeley's Creek by Ron Brooke. And again, it was like one of those sort of magical moments, you know, doors opened in my head and I suddenly saw what could be done with Southern Hemisphere sort of situations, environments, and, and characters. And so when somebody said to me one day, would you like to write a book for children? And I said, I'd love to do that. And they said, why don't you give it a go? And so I wrote Biddy Biddy, because I thought, what could be more New Zealand than a story about a sheep? And so I started writing Biddy Biddy. But in recent years, I've been looking back at stories that I can remember being told as a child, myself, by my mother and her um, brothers and sisters. And here is a photograph that I have found recently of, this is a photograph of my great-grandmother. Her name was Iriha Peti Haho. She was Tainui, she was from the Waikato, but her mother, was called Hinapo, and she came from Natiawa, from Fakatani. And um, I have found this photograph in recent years, and I have found not only this photograph of her, but several others as well. She must have been extremely well known at the time of her life, you know, during her lifetime. Now, Believe it or not, this photograph was taken in about 1864 or 65, when photography was just really getting started in New Zealand. And it was taken by a professional photographer in the Thames. And um, there's another copy of it, it to Papa, and they don't have her name attached to it at all. And so it's this sort of information that I knew little of when I was a child, and it's only really in recent years that I've found out more and more about these people. And um, in the early 1990s, we had a family reunion at Port Waikato, and, they, and they were, it was for the descendants of this woman. And they said, if all of her descendants turn up, there'll be 6,000 people here. Wow. Because she had 12 children. And one of those children was my great aunt and of course my grandfather and here is my great aunt at the age of 18 she married a scotsman and shifted down to southland and that's where my part of the family grew up and we were totally ignorant of this other huge family in the north island but my brother and i discovered them in the early 90s and i've now kept in touch with lots of them there are literally hundreds and here, there's the same woman with my granddad um, when they were old people. And this is my grandfather and my great aunt, taken in the 1920s. This might seem rather odd that this is my grandfather, and here he is in his late 80s, and it's the 1920s. He died in about 80, uh, 1935, 10 years before I was born. So I never had a chance ever to meet him. The reason he was so old was he was born in 1843. So it's those sorts of stories that I find really inspirational. I think, oh, gosh, I'd love to have met those people. But I sort of make up stories and fit them into it, along with little bits of information. And here's a story that I wrote about my great aunt, using the little bits of history and story 
that my mother and her sisters used to tell me. The things that they knew about her living in Fort Rose in Southland at the mouth of the Matovita River. She lived there until she was about 93, 94. And I have no idea whether she, had, she kept in touch with her family in the North Island. But all of those people, all her brothers and sisters, they all stayed where they were born. She and my granddad were the only two that actually left and went south and spent the rest of their life in Southland. Biddy Biddy is a book that we've already mentioned. Again, it's full of stories that relate to my life, to me. There's a, one of the, one of the pages shows this old hotel. And actually, this drawing was based on that photograph that I took. It was an old, an old hotel that used to stand over the railway line in Sheffield, just uh, sort of southwest of Christchurch. Those of you who have driven from Christchurch to Arthur's Pass, if you drove that road in the late 70s and the early 80s, that building was still standing. It's no longer there. But I took a photograph of it and used it in my book to give it a kind of sense of authority and a sense of place. Yeah. Um, it was an interesting building. Nowadays, it would be boarded up and it would have, ha would have a great big fence around it and you would not, not be allowed anywhere near it because it didn't have any floors. You could go in and clamber around across the floor joists and so on without any floorboards. Uh, Mrs. McGinty and the Bizarre Plant is another book that makes direct reference to actual places and actual things. And here is a house that I used uh, in the book. This is a real house. It exists in Aldwins Road in Linwood in Christchurch, and it's still there. And one day when I was talking to a group of children at Linwood Primary School, which is just down the road from this house, the little boy put his hand up and he said, excuse me, but in your book, Mrs. McGinty lives in my auntie's house. <laughs> <laughs> and here it is, as it appears in the book. It looks much nicer in my book than it does in reality. <laughs> it hasn't been well cared for. And people have made additions to it which don't suit it. Um, in the back, at the back of the house, of course, is the great big plant. Um, and then beyond that is the, is the Edmunds Baking Powder Factory. Edmunds Baking Powder Factory, one of my favourite buildings, was demolished by Ron Briley in the, what, early 90s, late 80s, something like that. It was such a shame. It was so strongly built that it took them months and months and months to take it down. Linwood High School, where I was teaching at the time, they asked Mr. Briley if he would like to donate that building to the school as an arts centre as a performing arts centre. And he said, no, we want to demolish it and put up a petrol station on that site, which is what they did. And it was an iconic building. It was one of the things, you know, it was a, on the cover of all those Edmunds baking powder books throughout New Zealand, which I think is still the best-selling book in New Zealand ever. Um, Aotearoa is full of references to actual places. And this is one of the biggest projects I have ever done. Um, about three years ago, my editor at Penguin Random House rang up and said, would you like to do a big book about the history of New Zealand? 64 pages aimed at, say, nine-year-olds. I said, I'd love to do that. Sounds fantastic. And then two nights later, I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning and sat and thought, my God, I'm never going to finish that book <laughs> by this time next year. That is ridiculous. And so I started work on it. I started researching it. Well, it was really deciding what you were going to leave out as much as what you were going to put into this book. But I really, really wanted to show the two main threads of New Zealand history. I wanted Māori history, Pākehā history to be sort of woven through the whole book. And... Um, so I started planning page by page by page what was going to go on each page. 
And uh, then I had to research those things. I had to decide what was going to go onto each page, like the details, um, what sort of pictures I was going to use, and what sort of information I was going to put under, under the pictures. And so one of the early pages of the book uh, was looking at the migration of early Māori to New Zealand. Now, when I was at primary school, we were told a lot of rubbish about the history of New Zealand. We really, really were. It was very Eurocentric. We used to learn... I can still remember in my, second, uh, in my social studies book ruling up a page which said, Good Governor Gray. Well, I found out he wasn't so good any, anyway, and he was really a rat bag. And yet we were told that all these white guys were really, really good. And they came here to do great things, and they changed the way the Maori lived, and they did all sorts of stuff. And we were told that the Maori had originally arrived here in seven canoes. Well, I didn't realise that there were hundreds of waka, and they came here over many generations. They didn't just all come at once, like one weekend, and arrive here and then just trot all over the place and find places where they want to live. It wasn't like that at all. It was much more systematic, and there's a lot of evidence to say that they originally came and they went back to where they had come from, and then they came back again. There was a kind of backwards and forwards between the islands of the Pacific and Aotearoa. They have found stones and other artefacts that only exist in New Zealand. They have found those in the islands where these early Māori came from. So I found that really quite exciting. And I wanted to tell that story in my book. Um, we're, jumping around, we're jumping through this little book. A no, that's book okay. Is that all right? You interrupt me if you need to. Yeah, I'll let you go through these. And okay, right out. Um, this is a page f uh, about the First World War. Now, just in recent years, there's been a huge number of books for children about the First World War, you know, especially about Gallipoli. There's a huge number of books out there. So my challenge was to come up with a page that perhaps brought some fresh light to that information. And I found that there were a lot of animals involved in the First World War, not only horses. I mean, New Zealand sent 10,000 horses to the First World War. None of them came back. 10,000. That was just from New Zealand. Uh, some, something like 200,000, or it might have been more than that, uh, were used, were, were sent um, to Europe from England. None of those survived either. And then there were other little stories about Magpies and slugs. Slugs were used to um, detect gas. And uh, there was a, even a pigeon with one leg um, that was regarded as a heroic um, creature by the French for carrying uh, messages into war-torn areas. So I did quite a lot of concentration in my story on those, in my page on those things there. And the other, of course, the other big impact that the First World War had on New Zealand was the return of the Niagara um, with the flu on board. And 8,000 people in New Zealand died of the flu, most of whom were Maori. Now, we, we don't really know very much about that. We hear about the people um, who died at Gallipoli and other battles uh, in Europe at that time, but the people who actually died here in New Zealand because of the flu um, was even greater. And this is the Second World War. It looks a bit empty because it's designed to take text. So some of these some people say to me, why don't you exhibit your illustrations like in a, in a gallery? And I said, well, they're actually not works of art as such. They're part of a book. And often there are gaps and holes in the pictures to accommodate text. And those gaps and holes make some, sometimes throw the balance of the picture out. And so this looks a little, a bit sort of open and bare. 
But when you see it with the text in place, it all sort of falls, to, it all fall, comes together. Um, I need to say that the picture of the soldier there is my dad. He went away with the first echelon, and that I drew that from a photograph um, that he had taken in his uniform outside my grandmother's house in Ettrick Street in Invercargill. And so I drew him and popped him in there as he represents all those from New Zealand who went off not knowing what they were going to face. And this is, oh, sorry, no, we're going back a bit. This one here. Um, clothing in New Zealand. This was another opportunity for me to feature some people from my own family. Because I've got lots of photographs at home, and there's old photograph albums of people really dressed up to the nines because they just happened to be going into town for the afternoon to do a bit of shopping. And over at the bottom left-hand corner on the South Island, you can see an elderly woman with a handbag on her arm with a hat and gloves on, uh, with hat and gloves and heavy coat and smart shoes, standing next to a small boy with a tam shanter That's me. And that's my grandmother. And we were in Invercargill, and we were going three blocks away to go into town to do some shopping. And that's how you dressed in those days. This is about, what, 1949? And we were going to town. You had to look your best. <laughs> and here, the next person along in the same row of small people is my uncle, Uncle Jack, at the races. Again, dressed in his very best three-piece suit. Um, there was my wife, Vivian, in the 1970s when we went to London. She's wearing an Indian dress that she bought in Oxford Street. And then there is a picture. The next drawing is my mum and dad in Christchurch walking through the Cathedral Square on their honeymoon. Mum's got a fox fur, real leather handbag and real leather shoes and real leather gloves. And then the next pictures across there are other members of my family as well. Finishing finally with my granddad at the age of 25, sitting with a big dog at his feet, um, photograph, photographed in a photographer's studio. Right. All right, Kevin, I'm just going to pause you there because I just want to talk a little bit more about this book. I don't know if anyone saw the article in the mail yesterday, the Nelson Mail, where I did say it's something of a taonga, and I really believe that. It's the sort of book I do think should be in every New Zealand home. It's an amazing feat, Gavin, um, in that it covers, you know, our history. Right, right back to 85 million years ago with an asteroid hitting Earth and right up to present day. Um, and, it's, and it's the other wonderful thing about it, Gavin, is how accessible it is for all ages. You know, you can, as an older child, sit through and really read it. Um, but you could sit with a younger child and dip into it. And there's wonderful pages that focus on a theme. Um, so there's one on food. And there's all sorts of wonderful facts. So one in here that I loved was about minties. Guess how many minties are eaten every year? Does everyone know what a minty is? It's the chewy peppermint lolly. Any ideas? Oh, sorry, I need, need my glasses. F 500 million are eaten every year. Um, and I just wanted to share with you, if I can find it, um, there's some lovely facts. This page is just on birds, New Zealand birds. Um, and here's just a few facts that I loved. So you know how tui can make that lovely, the lovely like flute sound? And then they also do that kind of <laughs> noise. Does anyone know why they can do such different sounds? Because they've got two, or Gavin might tell us, they've got two, two tongues and two voice boxes. Um, just a couple of other bird facts. Um, guess how many chicks pee waka waka raise every year? 40? Not 40, so? 20, up to 20, which is quite a lot of babies to raise <laughs> every year. And one other, you might have heard this one before about kereru. What's a kereru? Wood pigeon, 
If they eat too many berries, what happens to them? Anyone know that? They can get drunk, yeah. <laughs> so the, the book is just full of wonderful um, gems like that. There's another one, the, the Wakatoa could carry up to 100 warriors. You know, so you imagine those waka just filled. Um, were, were there any parts, Gavin, that you particularly enjoyed working on in this book? Well, actually, I was in a kind of state of panic for most of the time I was working on that book because I kept thinking, I've got to get this finished by such and such a time. And so I was in a state of sort of anxiety, great anxiety. And so I can't say I enjoyed much of it at all. Um, <laughs> did did I, you say I, you completed it in a year? Was it a year? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Oh, well, yes, it was a year. Um, mm -hmm. But I kept coming across bits of information which I found absolutely staggering, you know, just just amazing. I just kept thinking, I had no idea that that was the, the case, you know. It was really, really interesting. And um, I tried to find things that no one else would have heard of. Well, not many people. And so on the disasters page, for example, um, there are some monuments there that I don't think anyone would know unless they were locals. And I found this monument on the west coast um, west coast of the South Island, and it, it, is, it is weird. It's like a kind of little mini, um, 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 I can't even see it. It's like a little mini Greek uh, temple, and I've never seen it. I've only seen a photograph of it on the internet, and it was obviously made by the locals to somebody who had been killed uh, by some bank, by some gold, by some robbers. They thought he had some money. They thought he was carrying money or thought he was carrying gold. And they killed him. And the locals were so uh, appalled by this action that they built this monument to him. And it is the strangest little, it's like a slab with legs. It's like a big fat table made of concrete. And, um, I just sort of got a weird little thing, you know, that I'm sure nobody in the rest of New Zealand would know anything about. So I, I've tried to find those sorts of things, as well as famous things, um, famous monument. And there's also some Nelson connections in the book. So this, this page is transport, and there's a family here from Nelson in their car. And they're riding along in early 1900s. Um, and then another one, some of you may remember the K Jam factory that was in Nelson. Does, does anyone remember? Yep. Christine's nodding her head. So that's, a, that's another one on this page. This is employment, so all the different ways What does it say about the jobs. K Jam factory? It says something about the number of tins of jam they made one day. Yeah, so. gosh, I need my glasses up here. <laughs> uh, 10,000 tins of jam were filled at the K Jam factory in Nelson. This is just on the one day on 14th of February, 1884. That's right. This is full of really useful bits of information. So, <coughs> um, so yeah, we could talk at length about that book, but we're going to move on to talk about Cook's Cook. Yeah, Aotearoa is old news. We're now on to a new book um, that I've just had launched at the new library in Christchurch called Tūranga, which is fantastic. It is the most superb building. It is just amazing. And um, I was very privileged to, to be able to publish, uh, to launch this new book called Cook's Cook, the cook who cooked for Captain Cook. Uh, there, uh, when was it? The, well, Tuesday night. Tuesday night, last Tuesday. And um, again, it's one of those books that was commissioned by a publisher. And um, the Gecko Press people telephoned me and said, how about doing a book about the endeavor, the voyage of the endeavor? Picture book, children. I said, do you know how many books there are about the endeavor out there? There are hundreds, hundreds, and quite a lot for children. There's the book about the goat that traveled around the world twice, and the second time it was on the Endeavour. 
Uh, there's the book about the small boy on the endeavour. There's a, there are dozens and dozens of books about the endeavour. And I said, look, I think you're wasting your time and you're wasting my time. And they said, well, nevertheless, we'd like you to think about it. So I started reading some books about the voyage of the endeavour and I found it was absolutely fascinating. Again, I learned very, very quickly how little I knew. I knew very, very little about shipping at that time, about the Navy, about the hierarchy of the Admiralty. Uh, I didn't know anything about that. Uh, I sort of, sort of had a rough idea, but I didn't really know how it was structured. Um, and so I, I, I was reading this, this book, one bit, book in particular one day, and I had a list of all the people, the names of all the men that were on the ship when it left Plymouth in 1768. And one of the men was a man called John Thompson, and it had John Thompson Cook. And I thought that could be interesting to look at the cook who cooked for 94 people every day. And what's more, when I did a bit more reading, I found he only had one hand. <laughs> the original cook that was appointed to this, this position by the Admiralty had only one leg. Oh, really? <laughs> and James Cook, who wasn't a captain at the time, he was a, he was a, uh, um, a lieutenant, and he said, no, I'm not going to have him, and sent him back. <laughs> so the Admiralty provided him with another cook with only one hand. <laughs> and when James Cook complained about him, they said, sorry, like it or lump it, you've got to take him. He's, he's the cook. He had a few other challenges too, didn't he, Gavin? He, he, the ship was built for 16 passengers and he ended up having to cook for... 94. The, the, the Endeavour um, was a collier, which is a ship designed to carry coal. And it carried coal around the coast of England. Well, then it was sort of recommissioned and uh, it was taken into dry dock, I suppose, and it was reconfigured. It wasn't made any bigger, but they put more accommodation into it. And they changed its name from the Earl of Pembroke to the Endeavour. And they appointed James Cook as the, um, well, he was a captain, but he wasn't called captain. He didn't have the rank of captain at that stage, but he was going to be the captain of the ship. And um, when he was just about to sail, or just about, you know, just about ready to set a time for sailing, Joseph Banks appeared, and he was a naturalist, and he had lots of money. And he said he would like to go on the voyage as well. So some more cabins were squeezed into this space. And so, as I said, eventually, a ship that was designed to take a crew of 16 set sail from Plymouth, 1768, with 94 on board. 11 of those people were um, associated with Joseph Banks. He had a team of 11 people and two dogs. One dog was a greyhound, the other was a mongrel. And um, he had an enormous amount of luggage because he liked to dress well. And he was only 25. So he was a very dashing young guy, beautifully dressed, set sail on this very small ship which had a very shallow draft. And so it bobbed around all over the place. And for much of the early few weeks, or even months, Joseph Banks and his men were very, very ill because the ship was constantly all over the place. And, and to have somewhere for all those men to sleep, they slept in an unusual place. Didn't they? they did. They did. We'll go through. This is, this is a, um, this is a um, you know, a, a section, a sectional drawing of the hull, showing where people fit it. Um, what I didn't realise is that no one except for the captain and a, a very small handful of officers were allowed up on the deck. Everybody else had to stay below deck, unless you were in the rigging or doing some work. But if you weren't, then you were below deck the whole time. And there were no windows. There were some kind of big... Um, 
kind of air vent type things uh, above the heads of the people on the first area, on the mess deck, but below that, there was nothing. And you could imagine the ventilation in some of those small cabins that you couldn't stand up in. They were only like four foot three high or something like that. And the cook, John Thompson, in one of his uh, pieces that I read about, he was complaining about the smell of the young officers' cabins. They said they were gross. He said they were gross. And so I suppose it was just lack of ventilation. But anyway... Um, here is the cook. Now, one of the jobs that the cook had to do was to clean the ship's bell. And that was because the flue from his stove, the uh, stove on the mess deck where he cooked all the food, the flue came out near the bell. And so all the black smoke from the coal that they burned blackened the bell. And it was the cook's job to keep it clean. These are some of the uh, provisions supplied by the Admiralty. Now the Admiralty had its own farms. They grew all their own vegetables and ca uh, cattle and pigs and slaughtered them all and butchered them and preserved them in salt, stored them in barrels and put them on these ships that were constantly leaving England for other parts of the world. And I'll just say, Gavin, this, this page, and in, in a bit like Aotearoa, it's full of gems all the way through and amazing facts, but this is wonderful to look at, just to read what they took on board. So there's things like um, 2,500 pounds of raisins, 16,000 pounds of beef, 20 bushels of salt. What do you think a bushel was like? Anyone know what a bushel is? It's a how, how many type kilos of weight. Would that be? How many kilos? I'm would not be? sure. And uh, thirty-five thousand pounds of bread. But not know. bread as we know it. Biscuits. Ships' biscuits that were made of flour and water and nothing else. And within a very short time, the weevils got into these biscuits. And you had to, there was a procedure before you ate them, you had to knock them on the table, knock the weevils out before you could eat them. But Joseph Banks actually said, well, actually, after a while, you get used to the taste of weevils. Weevils are quite spicy ah, and quite, quite hot, a bit, bit like of, chili. Um, extra protein, too, probably. Yeah. Sometimes they heated them and the weevils all ran out because it got too hot on the biscuit. And along with weevils, John Thompson had to deal with uh, maggots and cockroaches and rats. Lots of rats. What do you think they use the raisins for? What, do they, what would they use the raisins for? Yes? Putting in the Putting in the porridge or putting in the puddings. And most days at lunchtime, they had meat, they had sauerkraut, and they had a pudding. And the pudding was boiled in a bag with the meat. All in the same cauldron. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the food that the men, I'm talking about the crew who did all the hard work, the food that they ate was enormously calorific, 4,000 calories a day or something they were, they were provided with. And then late afternoon, early evening, a lot of booze. So I don't know whether to keep everybody happy or I don't know what it was, but there was an enormous amount of beer and uh, well, wine for the officers, uh, spirits, rum, things like that. Uh, this is Joseph Banks and his crew. Um, a lot of these people we already know about. We know about Solander, um, and we know about uh, Sidney Parkinson, the young artist. He was very young. He was only, what, barely 20, I think. He's really young. Um, but we don't know very much about some of the servants, and they're quite interesting. There were two... Uh, freed slaves from Jamaica that were taken on this voyage, and they were there as servants of Joseph Banks. Now, when this book was, this book is going to be published in America as well, and the publisher over there contacted me when they saw the, the roughs for this book, and they said, are you certain that those two black 
people on that ship were servants and not slaves. I said, well, in all the books I've read, they're referred to as servants, Joseph Banks' are servants. And they said, well, if they're slaves, they must be called slaves. So I researched and researched, I read and read and read as much as I could about, you know, to try and find out some more information about these two guys. We had their names. Finally, I came across a very obscure piece of poetry that mentioned one of them by name, and it mentioned that he had previously worked for a botanist, and he was a qualified plant collector. And that's why, obviously, Banks took him with him on this voyage. And there is a mention of Banks going on expeditions on land to collect plants, and he took this guy Dalton with him. Now, you won't find that information anywhere else, except for in my book. <laughs> I haven't come across it anywhere else. It was only in this kind of funny, obscure piece of poetry I found online. Um, there are the two dogs, and there is the goat on its second voyage around the world. It had already been around the world once before on the HMS Dolphin, and this was its second voyage around the world. It was a milk goat. It was there to provide milk for the officer's coffee, and it, it survived the entire journey where 38 men died. That goat stayed as good as gold. And in fact, James Cook grew so fond of that goat, he took him home with him at the end of the voyage, and he lived in his backyard for many years. <laughs> I was just going to say, Gavin, on this page, if you can read it from there, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, um, a recipe is there, which, you know, we all know roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, but that's probably the only recipe you might recognise, and they get progressively um, unusual from more, there. Slightly more bizarre, don't they? Uh, this, this recipe, of course, was a celebratory dinner to mark their departure from England. And the cook was told to go and cook roast beef and Yorkshire pudding for 94 people. And this was his recipe. I didn't make these recipes up, by the way. They are actually recipes from the time. Um, the other thing that I found fascinating was that there were a lot of animals on board. There were sheep. And there were uh, chickens and pigs all on board. And at the time, it was quite common, even in big sort of warships, that the Admiralty um, put provisions on. Sometimes there were cattle beasts tied up between the guns. It must be a terrible life. I mean, there they are, you know, just sort of uh, roped up into one small space, and that was their place. It didn't move until it was time to be sent down to the cook. Um, from time to time, Joseph Banks would, cook, would kill something. He killed lots of stuff, of course. That's what naturalists did in those days. They traveled around the world killing stuff and then doing drawings of it. Um, some of the stuff was dried and preserved and taken back to England. Some of it was eaten by the crew. And here is, um, we can see the cook chopping up um, a big shark that Joseph Banks had managed to catch. Joseph Banks had a small uh, row boat, rowing boat, um, called the Yawl, which he took whenever uh, he could and go off and uh, collect stuff from the sea around the ship. And uh, it's interesting to read that the crew on the Endeavour would not eat the shark meat because they thought that sharks sometimes ate people. So therefore, there could be some kind of residue of those people in that shark, and therefore, they didn't want to be seen as being cannibals in any way. So up here, there's a mention about some rats. And I think we've missed a page, haven't we? Doesn't matter. We'll flip on. We'll keep moving. Keep moving. Uh, Tierra del Fuego was one of the uh, places they stopped on their way to the Pacific. The Endeavour, by the way, I didn't mention this, but the Endeavour had been 
the whole point of the voyage was to go to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus. And Cook was also given a letter, a secret letter, by the Admiralty, from the Admiralty, instructing him to explore the Southern Oceans to see if there was a large southern continent that it might exist in the south. They realized, they, no, they sort of thought at the time that because there was so much land in the northern hemisphere, in the northern part of the, of the earth, there needed to be the same amount of land in the southern hemisphere to, to create a balance. Without that, they said the earth would tip and spin around and go haywire. And so he was given this special letter that he wasn't to open until he'd finished his work in Tahiti, and that would give him instructions for searching for Terra Incognita. I, was, I might just pause you there, Gavin. That on this page you'll see albatross, and this is one of the recipes in the book, and I might just read this recipe. So albatross, pull off the skin and feathers... Soak the bird overnight in salt water, then parboil it. Throw the water away and cut the meat up. Stew until tender. Serve with prune sauce, ground ginger, and a sprinkle of sugar. Garnish with boiled wild celery and a sailor's biscuit. And I was just going to ask you, Gavin, if you have attempted any of the recipes. Not, not with albatross, obviously. Well, albatross is very hard to catch. <laughs> but I wondered if you might have... Uh, tried cooking this, say, with chicken, with the prune sauce and ginger and... Well, you can see, you don't need to really. If you can sort of imagine what it's going to taste like. <laughs> yeah. What I was interested to read, though, w was how often they included um, things that I didn't expect them to use. Like, they used a lot of spices and a lot of um, ginger and um, mustard, things like that, in their dishes at this time. Um... No, I, I somehow thought they wouldn't have. Anyway, uh, unfortunately, Tierra del Fuego was the place where the two African servants, or Jamaican servants, died. Uh, they were left in charge of the rum on an expedition ashore when a snowstorm suddenly arrived, and they died of exposure and drunkenness. So... They didn't, they didn't get any further than Tierra del Fuego. They didn't get to Tahiti. They didn't get to New Zealand. Um, <clears throat> we'll flip on from there. And eventually they arrived in Tahiti. Uh, they were greeted very warmly and given lots of fresh food to eat, which John Thompson was quite pleased to see, but also it meant more work for him because it was relatively easy to drag another lump of um, beef out of the barrel, uh, the barrel and throw it into the cauldron. Uh, but when you had to actually prepare some fresh uh, fish and things like that, it was extra, it was extra work for him. Uh, one of the things that all of the crew tried at this stage, and especially James Cook, was dog, Pacific dog. And Pacific Dog was unlike the dogs that we have today. It was a gentle, relatively small creature, very timid, with kind of fair hair and no bark. And it lived with the Tahitian people in their houses as a pet. But when the time came, when they needed a good meal, poor old Pooch was knocked on the head and popped into the umu. So they were fed and served up to James Cook and the other officers. And James Cook was very enamoured um, of the flavour of the dog. He said it was as good as English lamb. You can see on this page there's dog and breadfruit stew. And I think breadfruit was a bit like a... Um was it mostly like potato? It's like that, yeah, it goes on a tree, of course. Um, the other thing, I didn't know this, but, um, but, uh, but at this particular time, the Tahitians were mainly vegetarian. They ate fish and they ate um, birds and things like that, but not 
to the extent that it was the biggest part of their diet. They ate um, fruit and vegetables that they grew. And Cook and his men mistook their plantations for being natural forests. They didn't understand that actually the Tahitians were growing breadfruit trees and were uh, careful of their use and they didn't over harvest and, and all these sorts of things. But then when Cook arrived there with 90 people on his ship and they stayed for three months, they just about ate these people out of house and home. They went and plundered all these, so, you know, they thought fr uh, freely growing fr breadfruit trees. They plundered all the, the lagoons and uh, seashores for uh, seashells, uh, uh, shellfish and ordinary fish. Um, they didn't realize that they were actually taking stuff from the Tahitians. So when the Tahitians actually started taking stuff from them, like nails and glass and rope and stuff like that, James Cook got particularly annoyed and never really, really understood that it was kind of a, they were doing the same sort of thing themselves. Um, I just love on this page, given that there's a sort of a change in the color palette. Yes. With the fish and the, and the flowers, you know, in the air. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your artwork and how you've done the... Yeah, I tried to keep it uh, sort of mono monochromatic uh, right from the start so that it looked as if it was something... Perhaps the artwork may have come from that particular time. I was very, very influenced by the work of Thomas Rawlinson, who was a cartoonist, a satirist, who lived at exactly the same time as... James Cook. And I love his drawings. They're so loosely done. They've just been done with a pen, a quill, I should suppose, dipped in ink, drawing, and then a bit of watercolour sloshed over the top. But he used lots of speech bubbles and little name tags and little, little labels in the actual, on the actual page. And I was very influenced by that when I was doing this artwork. Yeah, that's a good the, example. The name tags here and the speech bubbles and, and the monochromatic art. That one there. Mm. See, the little name tags, speech bubbles and that sort of thing. That is directly, I flogged that from Thomas Rawlinson. I thought, um, it, was a really, I thought it was a really nice thing to use. We're just getting close, aren't we, Kerry, to oh, um, right. allowing some question time. Okay. So we may not right get right. through the whole book. No, that's all right. That's fine. Um, so, I'll, th I'll throw it out to questions to you guys in a second, but one thing I did want to ask is, if you enjoy cooking, Gavin, and what sort of cook you are? I do. I cook about twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> and it's usually a sort of something that might take me all day. Like, I might make a kind of a convoluted, elaborate curry where I have to, you know, cook things at various times throughout the day. But no, I generally leave the cooking up to my wife. She's a much better cook than I am, and she is really very interested in food and ingredients and things like that. And I said, well, no, I'll just get on with cooks cook and let her do the cooking. She's Good. the cook that cooks for me. So any questions from the audience out there? I've, I've got plenty more to ask, but you guys might have some burning questions. A father. That's a good story. That's a good question. Thank you. Does anybody know what a father is? Well, it's a special patch that you make for a wooden ship out of a sail and some sort of straw and any other kind of sort of, you know, sort of textured stuff like unraveled rope and animal dung. And on this particular occasion, the goat and the dogs provided the dung. They mixed it up with the straw and the uh, unraveled rope, and they plastered it all over the bit of sail, and they attached it to the bottom of the ship when a hole was torn in the hull by a coral reef. 
up the coast of Australia. And that was, made it possible for them to get safely into, into a harbour so they could repair the ship. So that's what a father is. I didn't know that though before. I sound as if I do now, but I didn't know. Um, sorry, I should have said, if you can come up to the microphone if you've got a question. Um, where did you find most of your information um, that's in the books and like, what's your process for researching the information that's in it? Thank you. Well, it's, it's quite a complex um, process. You see, when you're writing a picture book, uh, you know when you start that you haven't got very much that you can include in the book. So th the most important thing is to tell a story that holds together like a beginning, middle and end. That's what I wanted most of all. So I had my main character and then I wanted him to be the focus. He was the person that was telling the story. So when you read this story, it is told by him, as if, almost as if he was writing a journal himself. Now, whether he could read and write, I don't know whether he could. But I sort of pretended that he could, and he's writing this journal. So that was the kind of structure that I used. And then I wanted to show where the ship was at particular times. So I chose specific places like Rio de Janeiro, Tierra del Fuego, Tahiti, New Zealand, Australia, Batavia, South Africa. Those, those were, that was the kind of, the, the, those were the places that need to focus, you can be see focused. It there it is in there. On the, there's a map at the back showing and the And if you lift journey. that flap, by the way, there is where you'll read about the father. <coughs> there's, a, there's a glossary on the back uh, end paper. And so what I, I, went, I went to, I got a lot of books out of the library. Uh, I went online. I wrote to various um, naval museums around the world. One in, um, where, where was it? Got born. <laughs> in Plymouth. Uk no, 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 no. 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 But Whitby, Whitby, Whitby. I wrote to the Whitby Museum and they were really, really nice. They wrote back and sent me information, sent me stuff. They even sent me a really good book called um, Fish and Ships about food on the ships at the time of the endeavour. Uh, I wrote to some um, naval museums who never replied, never ever got back to me, uh, but I got a lot of information. So I tried, to, a bit like Aotearoa, I tried to pick out really interesting things, or things that I found interesting, that might have happened in that particular place. Like in Tahiti, <coughs> what happened? Then I had to reduce it to just a few lines. So that was the kind of structure that I, I worked to. And I wanted to start with the cook, John Thompson, and I wanted to finish with him. Unfortunately, he died on the voyage of dysentery. But he continues in the book as a uh, maimed seagull. I'll find the other one. <coughs> so he does get back to England, but as a seagull. And he appears on the back page. See, there he is there, on the last page. And he's saying Thompson's porridge because there's some lovely humour in the book throughout where John Thompson's hoping something's going to be named, a place is going to be named after him. So, you know, they go through this strait and he's Thompson Strait, perhaps? Cook Strait. And that's happening throughout. <laughs> where he sees Taranaki, he says, Mount Thompson. And James Cook says... Mount Egmont. <laughs> so he, he tries desperately to get someplace native. Because you see, that's what, that's what James Cook did. Sailed around the whole of Aotearoa, renaming everything. He didn't say, hey, what's the name of this place? No, no, wasn't interested. He gave it a new name. So when he sailed past some islands in the north, he said, Poor Knight's Island. And that just happened to be his favourite pudding. If you were to have a name place, uh, place named after you, Gavin, what, what would you like it to be? A lake or a mountain or? I don't know. That's too big a question. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm far too modest to answer. <laughs> Kim, do you mind coming to the mic? Thank you. <sighs> but to be fair, I think James Cook renamed 
uh, mountains and rivers and uh, harbours to act as a navigational aid for those who were going to follow him. That was probably his main aim. Mm. Sorry. Um, actually, this question is connected to um, the earlier question about research because it sounds like you do a lot of time on research. Yeah. And is that predominant to the drawing that led the title? You said you had a year for the Aotearoa. Yeah. And so I was wondering about how that works out in time. You have, must have to produce your drawings quite quickly, or what is that process in comparison to your research? How does that... The, the, yeah. the research is the basis of the story in, this, in both these cases. Um, and if you... You've got, to, you've got to get that right. You've got to do that for a start. Once that's been sorted out, that's fine. Um, I was lucky in bo with both of these books to have very good editors who then took the material that I sent to them and they researched it further. And uh, they checked all the information and uh, they came up with suggestions. Because sometimes when you're working very close with something, you can't see it clearly. You can't see whether or not it actually makes sense to somebody else reading it. Uh, and so they were able to do that. They would, they would say, no, you need to clarify this a little bit more, or we could reduce this page here, we could re reduce the text on this page, we don't need to say all of that, and so on. And so th that's all part of the process. And in the meantime, though, I'm actually sort of just roughly sketching where the images are going to go and what the images are going to say. It's pointless, though, to do anything too final until the text has been pretty much sorted. So the text is really, really important because there's nothing worse um, than seeing a page where the text looks as if it's, there's too much text for the space you've left. It's got to be a very, very fine balance. And that's why I said before when people say to me that you should put your artwork on, up, on, you know, up on a wall or something for people to look at. Well, it, that's not the complete story, you see. The book is the thing. The images and the, sto and the words go together. So really you should put up a page from the book showing where the text is going to go because the text, whether you read it or not, creates a texture and a pattern which completes that image. Yeah, so they sort of speak to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that kind of process is this kind of constant It is, it's a constant juggling back and forth, juggling back and forth. you and yourself and the research and the imagery. Yeah. Okay. I love that Thank in you. picture books, that marriage between the pictures and the words. Um, we are at our time, but if there was any last, maybe one last, if there was a really burning question, Eli, can you come up to the mic? Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, what's your favourite book you've ever worked on? Um, I think it might be Piano Rock. Um, it's because, it's not because it's about me, but it's because it is about my early life, my early childhood, which is gone. And so have all the people that are related to that have all gone. So it's like something to remember them by. Yeah. It's a kind of remembrance of not only my early life, but also of the people who made it, who made it as good as it was. Yeah, and I love this book. As I said earlier, if, if you haven't read this, I really recommend it. Along with these. So, <coughs> Gavin, thank you so much for Pleasure. your time. Pleasure. Let's give Gavin a... <laughs>